Yes. And okay, so um, this is um, this is a talk that is the result of being uh, sidetracked a few times during my research project, and uh, that um, involve a lot of complicated concept, historically and very loaded philosophically. So uh, this is very much a work in progress, and I will take all the help I can get in the form of feedback on this talk. Uh, bearing that in mind. Um, this uh, the project is to examine the notion of Frigi and colorings and the parallels that have been made between Frigi and colorings and Gracian conventional implicatures in light of an argument for difference that has been made by Forst and Sander in 2019. I will dive a bit into this argument to the, uh, so bef um, after that after looking at the similarity between Frigi and colorings and Gracian conventional implicatures, I will dive a bit into this argument for difference. And um, what I found out when uh, studying it, and we can argue on this, is that it relies on a certain uh, theory of communication that very much focuses on um, speaker intention. Um, and now um, the question would be whether this argument to a difference supports uh, or is supported rather in a theory of communication that is um, more intersubjective, uh, in a theory of communication that takes into account intention ascription and intention uh, recognition. And um, the result of this, um, of this analysis has been, um, so, those are the spoilers. Um, the result of this analysis has been that uh, when we take into account um, a theory of communication that takes both uh, speaker and audience uh, role in um, um, in determining what in determining what is communicated uh, seriously, um, then it appears that uh, Frigian colorings and Gracian conventional implicatures are uh, way closer than uh, Sandra um, made them uh, out to be. And uh, so, and I will explain um, how this theory of communication uh, leads to a picture by which uh, co uh, using colorings, a speaker actually communicates something and actually brings forth a certain uh, meaning. Um, so, um, The notion of colorings uh, appears um, in Ubersin and Unbedeutung um, when uh, Frege uh, notices rightly that two sentences can express the same thought uh, while differing in colorings. They can have the same references, they can be true under exactly the same conditions, uh, while uh, there is a distinction in what Frege sometimes calls uh, tone. Um, and he also uses the more technical term, which I will be using throughout this talk, of coloring. Uh, the example that Frege gives is uh, the dog hold all night versus the cur hold all night. Uh, so the two sentences are true under the same conditions. Um, however, uh, the second sentence um, hints or conveys a certain additional connotation that the speaker disapproves uh, of the dog that they are uh, referring to. Um, and so Frege is far from giving a principled uh, definition or categorization of colorings, but the general idea is that colorings are lexical item or grammatical construction that do not affect the thought a sentence expresses, but introduce a difference in connotation or uh, tone. And Frege gives, uh, fortunately, a variety of examples, uh, active versus passive voice, um, another example is the formal versus informal address in languages that do have uh, the distinction. So, tu versus vous in French, uh, tu versus lei in Italian, um, etc. Um, Frege also introduces evaluatives, uh, such as fortunately, damned, 
and um, and another uh, idea is um, a difference between adversative markers like but and uh, and. Um, okay, through so. Um, I uh, so it is tempting when seeing this first example: the, the dog old all night and the cur old all night to. Uh, um, so it is very tempting to introduce an analysis of slurs as a specific kind of colorings, which I will uh, not be doing, and I will leave this question completely open because this is uh, not a debate I want to engage in, but uh, this is something that can be discussed and researched, um, but just as a disclaimer. Um, colorings, uh, so from um, Frege's introduction of colorings, we can reconstruct a series of features that colorings have. Uh, colorings, have uh, colorings are assertively inert. Uh, asserting um, the cur old all night does not amount to asserting the extra hint or connotation that the use of cure conveys. So it does not amount to asserting that one disapproves uh, of a dog. Um, in addition, colorings are allegedly uh, inert. Uh, so they do not change the truth uh, conditions of a sentence. Um, the disapproval of a dog has no bearing on the truth of the assertion, uh, the cure old all night. And um, colorings are inferentially uh, inert. Um, the dog old all night and the cur old all night are logically uh, equivalent. And, um, a fourth feature that Forston Sender introduces and that will be the crux of the matter for this talk is that uh, colorings, according to um, this exegesis of Frege, are, some of them can be uh, communicatively inert. So some colorings do not communicate anything. and. Uh, and this is precisely um, this, uh, this is precisely the aspect of um, features of colorings that I will be uh, casting doubt upon. Because of these uh, features of coloring, it is very tempting to um, to liken them to uh, the latter. Uh, concept of conventional implicature that is introduced by uh, Paul Grice. Um, I will go back a bit on the notion of implicatures. I am sure you are all very familiar with it, but um, but I just love this example from logic and conversation. So, um, in general, the notion of implicature is the notion of a meaning that is uh, impli uh, that is distinct from what is said, and. Uh, the, first example that Grice provides of an implicature is, uh, is this. Uh, suppose A and B are talking about a mutual friend, C, now walking in a bank. A asks B how C is getting on in his new job. B replies, oh, quite well, I think. He likes his colleagues and he hasn't been to prison yet. At this point, A might well inquire what B was implying, what he was suggesting, or even what he meant by saying that C had not yet been to prison. Um, Implying, suggesting, or meant are non-technical term uh, that um, Grice will um, uh, will later like, later contrive under the term of uh, implicated and um, the um, notion of implicated content is uh, some extra inference that is a pragmatic inference distinct from what uh, B said, um, distinct from the literal. Uh, content of a sentence. Um, implicatures are distinct from the content, from what is said. They are generated by pragmatic inference and, um, and they are not entailment. They don't bear on the true value of the utterance. Um, this definition is very general and um, and this is why we can uh, further distinguish between uh, between conversational and conventional implicatures. Um, so, mm, so conversational implicatures are generated by pragmatic inferences on general um, and implicit 
maxims or rules of conversation, uh, while conventional implicatures appear to uh, follow from the conventional meaning of the words. In some cases, the conventional meaning of the words used will determine what is implicated, besides helping to determine what is said. If I say, smugly, he is an Englishman, he is therefore brave, I have certainly committed myself by virtue of the meaning of the words to its being the case that his being brave is a consequence or follows from his being an Englishman. Other examples that uh, Grice provides along this paper uh, are but or even um, and over, um, over uh, specific lexical items. Um, the distinction between uh, conventional implicatures and conversational implicatures um, is mostly exhibited by studying conversational implicatures. Um, conversational implicatures have a series of features that are non-detachable. If we change, um, um, if we choose different synonyms, different words, uh, with the same meaning. So uh, instead of saying, I'll oh, be hasn't been to prison yet, I say, I'll oh, be still hasn't gone to jail. Um, the inferences will uh, resulting from this utterance will still uh, be present. Moreover, conversational implicatures are cancelable. The pragmatic inferences are defeasible. Um, so I could, after saying, oh, um, C hasn't been to uh, jail yet, uh, I could say, oh, but I, I don't mean to imply it will, it will be dishonest now. And conversational implicature are not part of the um, meaning of the expressions. Um, and the contrast that Grace makes um, leaves uh, conventional implicature in a lot of neglect because uh, what we get uh, is that conventional implicatures are part of the conventional meaning of the words, but um, Grace does not introduce many uh, relevant features by which identifying conventional implicatures except for some examples. And we notice also that the examples that Grace introduces um, that even uh, therefore overlap with uh, the, some of the example that Frege gives of colorings. Um, but we're gonna need a bit more uh, to bring uh, these notions together. And uh, we do get a bit more uh, when Christopher Potts gives a more principled uh, characterization of the features of conventional implicators. Um, so following uh, Grice, um, Potts identify four features of conventional implicatures. Um, so first with Grice, uh, conventional implicatures are part of the conventional uh, meaning of words. They are, not, um, they are not exactly derived from rules of conversation, but instead they are already um, ingrained in the use of a certain word. Um, Moreover, and in the same way as conversational uh, implicature, conventional implicatures are commitments that the speaker is making. When a speaker utters, for example, is rich but honest, um, the speaker um, implicitly um, commits to the existence of a certain contrast between um, being rich and being honest. And uh, those commitments can be uh, later used um, in, let's say, uh, so let's say can be later used in uh, deductions in conversation. This is not the formal notion of an, an entailment. It is more the um, common grounds notion. Um, these commitments are made by the speaker of the utterance uh, by virtue of the meaning um, of the meaning of the word is it chooses. Um, so this is the um, aspect of detachability. So as we recall, conversational implicatures are non-detachable, um, which is if we use different words uh, with um, roughly the same content. So instead of saying uh, C. Um, hasn't been to prison yet, I say uh, C still hasn't been to jail. Um, the resulting pragmatic inference uh, is the same. So the um, implicature, the conversational implicature is non-detachable. Um, by contrast, um, conventional implicature are detachable. If instead of using but in the sentence is rich, uh, but is honest, I use 
end. Um, the, um, the following inference towards a contrast uh, between being rich and being honest is lost. Finally, conventional implicature are uh, in the same way as uh, colorings, logically and compositionally in independent of what is said. So they have no bearing on the truth uh, of a sentence, uh, of the utterance. And um, following these features, um, Potts um, introducing some some more example of conventional implicators. So we, we know a bit more where we are standing now. And um, what Potts introduces as uh, extra conventional implicator uh, are uh, supplemental expressions, such as uh, supplementary uh, relative clauses. So Jane, who is a mechanic, help me repair my bike. Um, or um, speaker-oriented um, adverbs, uh, oddly enough, I am alive. Or, and um, on the other end, another type of conventional implicature is uh, expressives. Uh, my damn bike as a flat tire again. Um, and all of these different expressions uh, implicate, they convey additional commitments. Uh, so um, in the first example, the commitment that Jane is actually a mechanic. Um, in the second example, that the speaker is surprised about the um, of the proposition that they are um, introducing. In the last example, the um, disapproval of the speaker towards their bike. Um, so uh, when we have this picture of uh, colorings and of conventional implicators, it is let's say, very uh, tempting to, um, to liken um, 3D and colorings to conventional implicatures. After all, we have the same principle, uh, we have the same, um, we have the same kind of be behavior. Colorings are also aletically inert. Um, They're also aesthetically inert. And, um, and uh, the um, they are also non uh, detachable. Uh, they are also detachable. Um, so, uh, how or why should we distinguish them, or should we, uh, on the contrary, um, assimilate them? Um, to distinguish, uh, so uh, to distinguish colorings from conventional implicature, uh, Sanger, uh, who introduces this uh, principled categorization of colorings. Um, categorizes colorings between uh, three, uh, well, two categories. And um, he argues that um, what Frege covers in the term, under the terms of coloring are on the one hand, some purely aesthetic phenomena. It is not really discussed what would be a purely aesthetic coloring. And I think later we can, um, uh, later we can, um, come back on this topic because uh, once we go to the second category of colorings with content such as um, and um, colorings with content are uh, colorings that hint at uh, certain extra connotation. Um, once we introduce the second category of colorings with content, it becomes a bit unclear what would be a purely aesthetic co uh, coloring that doesn't have any uh, bearing, any content whatsoever. Um, however, when we have colorings uh, that have content, um, we can uh, have two different behaviors. Uh, so some of those colorings, according to Sander, yet again, uh, communicate their content um, and um, their hint at a certain uh, meaning or proposition. In this category, it introduces um, but versus and uh, or a cur, um, maybe slurs would be in this category, uh, and uh, speaker oriented adverbs, unfortunately, oddly, um, etc. On the other uh, side of this category are colorings that do not communicate the content. Uh, so formal versus informal address, 
um, or the addition of it is true that uh, in an utterance or double negation versus a simple uh, affirmative sentence, um, etc. What is the reason behind uh, this uh, distinction uh, between communicative and non-communicative colorings? Uh, to make it very short, um, the, the idea behind this distinction is that uh, when using uh, formal, uh, well, informal address instead of formal address, the speaker does not generally intend to convey um, that a certain relationship of things. So um, the informal address should be used only when a certain relationship obtains between speaker and audience. Uh, however, um, the argument that Sanger makes is that when using an informal address, um, the speaker does not uh, wish to say, or well, to imply, to mean, to implicate that uh, this relationship obtains. Um, and I think this distinction uh, relies heavily on speaker's intention and what the speaker has present uh, in mind when she makes utterances and um, when she is uh, present in conversation. Um, the contrast is made with uh, so-called communicative coloring, such as but or cur, uh, where when using the expression, uh, the cur called all night, the speaker intends to communicate her displeasure uh, with respect to the dog she is uh, referring to. Um, okay. When um, when we notice um, when I saw this and when I saw this argument, I found this distinction, um, to put it mildly, extremely fishy. Uh, why? Because it relies on a picture of communication where uh, what matters uh, for what is communicated inside a conversation is what the speaker means to communicate, and um, the implicit aspect of this conversation is that uh, the implicit aspect of this um, definition of uh, non-communicative colorings is that, um, of course, if the speaker does not intend to convey that a certain relationship obtains, then she's not communicating it. Um, and um, so seeing this, I decided to dive a bit uh, deeper um, in what I found uh, problematic um, in these notions. And uh, what I found problematic there was um, was the point that uh, Grice makes in uh, his paper, meaning uh, from 1957. So the fact is that uh, in conversation, we usually, uh, the audience usually does not know what the speaker intends. Explicitly formulated linguistic or quasi-linguistic intentions are no doubt comparatively uh, rare. And um, to me and to a lot of people, the picture of communication should allow for way more intersubjectivity in that um, the audience um, is constantly trying to, well, is doing some guesswork, educated guesswork to try to reconstruct the speaker's intention. And, um, and this guesswork is uh, informed in their absence of explicitly formulated linguistic intentions, we would seem to rely on very much the same kinds of criteria as we do in the case of non-linguistic intentions where there is a general usage. An utterer is held to intend to convey what is normally conveyed or normally intended to be conveyed. And we require a good reason for accepting that a particular use uh, diverges from the general usage. For example, he never knew or had forgotten the general usage. Similarly, in non-linguistic cases, we are presumed to intend the normal consequences of our actions. Um, so yeah, this is this uh, general argument, which is that um, um, when a speaker is making utterances, her intentions in making an utterance are not transparent. And the only way that her audience has to actually know her intention is to rely on general um, uses or conventions. Um, 
And um, to me, this aspect of intention recognition is particularly important in communication. And I, I think that uh, we can build a contra example that is very reminiscent of um, the Getty case uh, towards um, a theory of communication that relies um, only on uh, speaker's intention. And this is this. Uh, so say I want to meet with Patricia, my friend, for drinks. I call her and I say, let's meet at the Descartes and go for drinks. I suggest the Descartes because although it's close, it's uh, ideally su situated for a meeting point. It's close to a metro, it has good parking spots, etc. And there are over nice bars in the same street. Now, Patricia is not from the same neighborhood and she doesn't know that the Descartes is closed. Thus, she will ascribe me um, based on very reasonable assumptions uh, that I intended to communicate or to convey that we would have drinks at the decade, the decade. So now what was actually communicated in my utterance, let's meet at the decade and go for drinks is not only um, is not only what I intended to communicate. It's not only, oh, uh, let's take the decade as a meeting point and uh, walk through the neighborhood finding a nice bar afterwards. Um, and instead, the actual result of my utterance has been to um, come, um, the actual result of my utterance um, as communicated, even though I didn't wish it to communicate. So an extra, uh, in, an extra proposition that we would have drinks uh, at the Descartes. Um, so, um, and so um, this is, yeah, this is the explanation of the same example. Um, and I think um, here, uh, Patricia's assumption in this case uh, are uh, perfectly fair and um, given a knowledge state. And if we take into account intention recognition, um, I have communicated that we would have drinks at the Descartes, uh, albeit, uh, although I didn't wish um, to communicate that, that we would have drinks at the Descartes because the bar is actually closed. Um, and um, yeah, because of, um, because of this, I, I think we have something that is way closer to an intersubjective proposal uh, on theory of communication. So um, the idea is that when performing an utterance, the speaker intends to communicate a certain content to her, to her audience. Um, let's say uh, I want to communicate the content that there are bees and that my audience should be careful. Uh, to do so, I should use uh, terms, expressions that are generally used to express such content. So I know as a competent speaker that um, there are some perfect, perfectly good expressions uh, to, that have been used before to communicate exactly this thing. So beware, there are bees, uh, that usually does the trick. Um, and the audience, upon hearing this utterance, ascribes the speaker an intention. Um, on the basis of general linguistic use. So the best explanation for uttering the sentence, uh, beware there are bees, is, to, is that the speaker intended to uh, issue a warning to stay uh, away from the bees. Um, does that intersubjective proposal uh, that takes into account general use um, prevent the introduction of new interpretations, new meaning. Um, does this uh, proposal prevent uh, communicating uh, that something that is not generally communicated? Not necessarily, uh, the, um, the provided that the audience needs some very good reasons to assume that the speaker deviates uh, from a general use. Um, and we can have some perfectly good reason to assume deviation from general use. Um, for example, the conversation takes place in an apiary um, and the speaker is an, ap uh, an apiculture. Uh, then the audience can, may, can um, assume fairly and has good reason to assume that what the speaker um, tries to express is not to keep away from the bees because the bees are everywhere. 
Um, and upon providing these good reasons, the speaker can communicate something else than what is generally communicated using certain expression. So knowing that the speaker is an apiculture and that the conversation takes place in an apiary, the audience can infer another, um, another variant on this warning. Maybe uh, beware there are bees does not mean stay away from the bees, but means actually don't step on the bees. I like the bees. Um, so what does that give us now that we have this intersubjective proposal on communication? Well, that gives something quite interesting, tying up together colorings and uh, implicators. And um, so this is the quite experimental part of this work, but uh, let's see. So it's rather fun. Um, the idea is that uh, so-called non-communicative colorings can trigger conversational implicatures based on the content. Um, and so this is an example. Um, say that, okay, oh, so in France, um, professors usually um, expect to be uh, formally addressed by students under um, 15 years old and, um, and under uh, when they are addressing and when addressing uh, people under 15 years old, French people usually use informal address um, very roughly. Um, so this example uh, is such, um, so a teacher tells uh, Anna, I ask you with informal address uh, to address me uh, formally. And uh, Anna answers, uh, and I ask you informal address to address me formally. Um, and um, so this is quite a um, nice example, actually. Um, because of the immediate avail availability of an alternative uh, to um, a sentence with a certain coloring. So um, when Anna uses the informal address, uh, it is salient to a French speaker that Anna presumably is, and that the teacher is, that Anna could have used uh, the formal address. Uh, so because of this immediate availability of an alternative, um, Anna um, triggers the conversational implicature that uh, she did not wish for, um, for multiple reasons to, um, to use the formal address. And um, so um, when using this non-communicative coloring, um, Anna um, conveys a certain conversational uh, implicature. Um, so here, um, a conversational implicature towards a refusal to use the formal address as long as a teacher uh, does not use uh, the formal address uh, to, address, um, to speak to her. And um, interestingly enough, um, this way of generating conversational implicature is built in uh, with colorings because um, in the ways um, that we have seen colorings uh, before, um, they, um, they sit in an alternative uh, relationship with over expressions that uh, do not convey the same hint. So when we use um, um, when we use an informal address, it sits, um, it's an alternative to uh, a formal address. When we use but, it's immediately an alternative to and that has the same truth condition. When, you use, when we use um, a double negation, it's an alternative to using the affirmative uh, sentence. Um, so uh, we can easily generate a conversational implicature uh, by using colorings. That's uh, the main point. And once we have uh, these conversational implicatures, what do we do with that? Um, so here those are some requirements uh, that I think are legitimate, but they are... Um, so the general idea is that a competent speaker is going to be aware of what a lexical item generally conveys. Uh, so Anna, presumably a competent speaker of French, um, will be aware that uh, the use of the informal address conveys a certain sense of equality and uh, 
is probably uh, con um, is probably also hinting at small uh, familiar or personal uh, relationships. Um, or that's not always the case, but yeah. And Anna is also aware that a sentence with a certain coloring is the alternative to a truth conditionally equivalent sentence. So um, she is aware that her two sentence is an alternative to a vu sentence. So she knows that when she uses is uh, the informal address in a sentence, she will be held by her audience to intend uh, to convey that the, um, that the formal address was inappropriate. And if we go back um, and if we uh, carry on with an intersubjective picture of communication uh, by which what is communicated by uh, the speaker is what is normally conveyed by uh, the use of a certain term, um, then Anna communicates what is normally implicated by the use of uh, this specific um, coloring. And um, as seen before, because uh, coloring stands in an immediate alternative relation with other colorings, um, this uh, point can generalize quite easily. And um, assuming that a competent speaker uh, knows uh, these alternations, and assuming that a competent speaker knows the specific contributions of colorings. So a competent speaker um, knows or should know that when she uses uh, that, she has an additional contribution of some sort of a contrast. Um, now, this is something we can uh, discuss, and I would really like to hear your thoughts on it, uh, because those are quite high requirements for speaker competence, but also um, I don't think this knowledge needs to be uh, explicit. Um, but speakers are generally aware of um, implicatures or inferences that a certain coloring, the use of a certain uh, term, is going to carry. And, um, and if we agree on this, um, on this idea that a competent speaker should know this specific aspect of a coloring, um, then she uses these colorings when she intends uh, the implicatures that trigger. And um, so, um, and, um, and so the argument to distinguish colorings from conventional, um, sorry, uh, so the argument uh, to distinguish non communicative colorings from communicative colorings kind of collapses as soon as we have a picture of communication that takes into account. Uh, intention recognition or intention ascription. Um, and um, in turn, um, since the existence of non-communicative coloring was crucial to distinguish non-communicative colorings from conventional implicature, um, the, um, uh, the distinction between colorings and conventional implicature is also uh, way less solid than it appears to be. And um, so, the argument hinged on the existence of non-communicative colorings. Some colorings convey contents that speakers do not generally intend to communicate. And um, the answer to this objection that I've been trying to um, um, I've been trying to argue is so what? Um, it's not because speakers don't intend to communicate something that they don't communicate it. And so in a more subjective view of communication, speakers are ascribed communicative intention. And when we take into account intention ascription, um, then they do communicate something that they use uh, when they use uh, some specific colorings. And um, so, um, so that was the general, uh, that was the gist of it. Um, you will notice that I kind of uh, set apart some um, more complicated, um, more complicated aspects of a problem. But um, so maybe a little addendum is that uh, I didn't examine the, the category of purely aesthetic coloring because the more I'm studying the no uh, this notion of colorings, the more I'm having doubts on what would be a purely aesthetic uh, coloring. Maybe the distinction between active and passive voice, like. Uh, Frege was mentioning, or maybe uh, syntax difference. Um, 
but um, in a picture where the speaker is conscious of this uh, intention ascription um, that is at play in communication, uh, then, um, then it appears even more doubtful that uh, you could have such a thing as a purely aesthetic with no bearing on, um, with no extra connotation whatsoever. Um, anyway, um, so, um, so that was kind of a picture of how uh, colorings um, and most colorings can be taken to be a communicative uh, device and, um, and should be, I think, taken as a communicative device. And yeah, um, some references are here and that's gonna be all for me. Okay, thank you.